Mm. I'm delighted to introduce to you Miriam Elbers. She is a theologian living in The Hague. She is currently senior acquisitions editor in the classical studies department at Brill. She is also the chair of the board of the Miskolta Foundation. And uh, finally, uh, uh, last but not least, she's working on dissertation in Leuven, in Belgium, on the theology of Miskotte, titled The Anti-Religious Testimony of the Bible, Criticism of Religion as a Theological Ally. An exciting title, I think. In this research, among other topics she focuses on, she also compares the work of Miskotte with the work of the Egyptologist uh, Jan Ashman. Um, again, to all of you, please feel free to already put your questions in the chat. And now we really look forward to your lecture, Miriam Elbers. There you are. <laughs> Hi. I'm trying to share my screen, but... Uh, are you already uh, made to a co-host? There yes. you are, yeah. Perfect, yeah. okay. Uh, let's see. How do I? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. Does this work? This works. Okay, great. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for this opportunity um, to explain a little bit about the central themes uh, in Miskotte's biblical ABCs, although my uh, paper is so simplistic that it only focuses on one theme, actually. I hope that's not a dis <laughs> disappointment. Um, in the occupied country of the Netherlands during World War II, Miskotte wrote, as we just heard, a booklet. In this booklet, he lifted, as it were, the daily profane struggle of the Nazi occupation, and especially the struggle of his Jewish fellow Dutchmen, to a thoroughly theological level. He identified it as a decisive spiritual struggle. And as I will argue in this paper, occupation was for Miss Cotton not only the historical situation during the five years of the German occupation of the Netherlands, but occupation is for Miss Cotton also the pagan natural human condition in general. Humanity is profoundly occupied and needs the word, the name in action, in order to be liberated from pagan religious occupying forces, whether these forces are political, spiritual, military, economical, or linguistic even. This theological approach is not informed by the historical situation as such, but by a careful phenomenological reading of the Hebrew Bible. And Biblical ABCs has a special place in the work of Miskotte. It's a little gem, in fact, between two other monumental works. Right before the German forces invaded Dutch soil, Miskotte had finalized his book Edda and Torah. We heard about that from Rinze, in which he compared the pagan myth of the Edda to the Hebrew Bible. And after, the surrender of the Dutch army, the book was forbidden and no longer available. After the war, Miskotte presented his view on the meaning of the Hebrew Bible in his magnum opus, When the Gods Are Silent, which essentially elaborates on what had already been sketched out concisely in biblical ABCs. Well, the booklet that we discuss today was actually written in a hurry. It was meant to instruct leaders of Bible groups and give them a sense of the structural elements of the biblical texts so that they could teach and lead the many reading groups that arose during the German occupation. Biblical ABCs has often been compared to a stock cube, holding together in this very small block 
all the oils and spices in a very compressed form a cube a stock cube from which the careful reader can make thousands of portions of theologically tasty soup when she has the patience to water the cube properly well i was asked here today to say something about the central themes in this little stock cube many themes could be mentioned here um, but i will discuss two major theological insights that run through the entire book and that constitute its theological position and its message. And actually, as I already said, in my perception, there is just one theme. And the second aspect that I would like to discuss is a derivative from the first and most prominent insight. And like with many aspects of Miss Cotter's theological ideas, uh, these two decisive themes at first appear as to be formal methodological issues, but they turn out to be crucial material theology. The first one that I would like to discuss is the reversal of the methodological order to gain theological knowledge. And I think that is the main and the, and the foremost issue. Miss Cotter denounces all pre-framed human categories or con concepts or in intuitions as ways to gain divine knowledge. He clearly advocates that all knowledge in this sense can only be derived from the specific event of the word, the word which comes from the name. Knowledge of God starts with the particularity of the name. Our knowledge goes from the particular towards the general and not the other way around. The second team is a subsequent insight that follows this primary one of the inversion of the methodological order and also breeds through the entire book, Miss Scott's thesis that the Bible is an anti-religious or an anti-pagan testimony. And I will come to that in the second half of this paper. The first insight, the first aspect is the method of the name. Miss Cotter's research and observations start with a methodological decision. He was inspired by the scholarly current of phenomenology of religion, which was established at the beginning of the 20th century. It was a response to, but also a criticism of, reductionist empiricism. Ms. Cotte embraced this approach, an approach of the so-called Wesenschau, the intuition of essences or observation of essences, which includes that the, observ the observer makes an existential connection with its object and that the focus lies on the observation of structures, whether the object is African dances or Greek, Greek epic or whatever. As Rinse Reling Brouwer already pointed out, this resulted in Miss Cotter's focus on keywords, grondwoorden, ground words, structural words and concepts that constitute the entirety of scripture. Additionally, this means that there is no special hermeneutics for biblical texts needed. Understanding scripture does not principally differ from understanding any text or phenomenon, pheno phenomenon or uh, dance or text. Already in this rather formal aspect of his theology, Miss Cotte prioritizes the concrete specific object of his research in his case, the biblical text, over the general concepts of religious studies or theology with which one would usually confront his object. So first and foremost, the text should be observed as a structured world of its own, apart from our pre-framed questions and concepts. This method also includes the suspension of judgment or the suspension of belief or disbelief, if you like, as Ms. Ms. Cotter clearly states at the beginning of biblical ABCs. The priority of the particular does not remain 
a methodological approach only. According to Ms. Kotte, it turns out that the biblical texts themselves have a preference for the concrete over the abstract, for the particular over the universal. To give an example, it's time after time that Ms. Kotte stresses that one should not too easily ignore the anthropomorphous character of the biblical texts. After all, in the Bible, we encounter a very concrete human manner of speaking. In contrast with what we might expect from a religious text, this anthropomorphous language about God and about human reality, it's not a primitive residue that we should overcome with our hermeneutics, with our exegesis in order to get then to the heart of the matter. On the contrary, according to Ms. Kotte, the anthropomorphic language and manner of speaking is the heart of the matter. This particular God is concerned with a particular humanity. The message of the Bible is not about abstract notions, but about concrete human particularities. Following this path, we soon come to the most important part of Miss Cotter's method. If we cannot pose our own concepts and assumptions upon the text that we try to understand, we cannot approach the biblical text with our concepts of God either. Here too, the biblical texts correct the reader with their particular order and with their particular anthropomorphous manner of speaking. There is not at first a general concept of God or Godhead <clears throat> that sets the tone in the Hebrew Bible, but a very special name. And the texts of the Hebrew Bible do not work with a general concept of Godhead, but introduce a particular name, the Tetragrammaton, usually rendered as the Lord, who then subsequently defines the concept the content of the concept God. Ms. Kotte shows how in Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the name takes central stage. And that is what I wanted to show in this text uh, from the new translation, of course. The word name is, as it were, the A of the biblical ABCs, the first and decisive line in the design of the thoughts of God. In the building of scriptural vocabulary, it's the cornerstone and it possesses a miraculous supporting capacity. It binds even the most disparate parts together and gives these contradictions a gleam of certainty that has no human origin. Whoever learns to fathom this word becomes truly Bible believing. Um, as you can see, it's a fantastic translation. <laughs> Only concern is this Bible believing. Um, well, I, I would rather say versed in scripture, but um, I think the idea is clear. The name itself is revelation in its optimal form. And that is why Miskotte calls his method the method of the name. Amidst the status quo, the things as they are, someone in particular makes himself known. Not a general concept of God or divine is decorated with an extra name, the predicate, the Lord. But according to Miss Cotte, it's the other way around. The unfamiliar name, it's even unpronounceable in a way because it's, it's four consonants. And we usually say the Lord or Adonai. The, this unfamiliar name is the starting point, the particular that takes the lead. Reading Israel's confession in Deuteronomy 6, the first part of the sentence should be stressed. The Lord is our God. The order Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, is irreversible. And I have a quote from that as well, also from the New Translation. God does not appear to us as the most general that which can be found everywhere, but rather as the most unique, that which can be sought and found somewhere specific. This does not mean God couldn't be the most general and the all-powerful and the omnipresent, but rather that the road to knowledge does not begin with the general. So there you have this methodological 
inversion uh, that is so crucial to And that the following chapters are about the order of the, of the virtues of God and about the unity of these virtues. Miss Cotte has done everything he can to make clear that the general concepts of divine attributes, such as infinity or omnipotence, should not be the frame in which we should try to fit the holy name, the A of the biblical ABCs. The characteristics or adjectives that are used for the Lord, for this special name, as well as God's other names, can only be understood from the unique name itself. As we learn from Miskotte in chapter 7, a name, a person, can only be known through his acts. So all adjectives or attributes, perfections, as Karl Barth calls them, cannot be but deriving from and related to this special name in his sole act of love. In this particular act, he may subsequently also be almighty and omnipotent. This is how Miskoto himself defines his method. This is the same structure as the Old Testament, uh, which is to speak the method of the name. Namely, first, this God is our God, and only then, this God is the only one, the almighty, the omnipresent, and so on. This priority of the particular appears thus on many different levels, as the methodological key in biblical ABCs, and in Miskotte's theology in general. It's a textual level, it's a methodolog methodological level, it's on the hermeneutical level, and it is even on the theological level that this is decisive. In all cases, the method of knowledge is always to start with the particular and then possibly move to the universal. Finally, I come to my second point. Um, and that is, of course, a derivative aspect of Miss Cotter's biblical ABCs. But it's necessary to understand his work um, it, it is his thesis that the Bible is an anti-religious and anti-pagan testimony. Miskotte's keen eye for the biblical keywords, ground words, and for the uniqueness of the name to which both testaments testify, leads to another crucial observation, that scripture is an anti-religious and anti-pagan testimony. This is a bold thesis. And it's one of the first statements that Miss Cotter makes in Biblical ABCs. He says that we have to turn to the teaching, to the Torah, again, in order to rediscover that the entirety of scripture goes against the natural religion of humanity, which means against our own natural religious inclinations. Let's start with Miss Cotter's notion of the anti-religious testimony. Carefully following the lead words of the biblical texts, Miss Cotter concluded that in scripture and first and foremost in the Hebrew Bible, there is something else at stake than an account of a general human religious experience, not the religious concepts that we might think or expect to be prominent in scripture, in the Magna Carta of Christianity, are testified to. On the contrary, our religious concepts may even be criticized by key words and key concepts that take the lead in the biblical text. Um, it is very telling that in chapter 11 of this book, book Biblical ABCs, Miss Cotter starts with a list of words that we might expect the Bible to talk about. It includes eternity, personality, nature, virtue. But it turns out that they are not even present in the Israelite scriptural worldview. Miss Cotter's own phenomenological approach to the biblical text made him aware that the Hebrew Bible deviates from the religious concepts that humanity inclines to live by, both inside the church and outside the church. 
he was obviously inspired by Barth's notion of religion. And Ms. Cotta called the Hebrew Bible, therefore, at first, an anti-religious book, as it questions all our natural religious inclinations. Unfortunately, I cannot go into Ms. Cotta's own theological development. At first, he had a rather positive approach to the concept of religion, but it changed and it became a partly uh, Barthian concept of religion. And I can also not go into the ways in which Ms. Cotta differs from Barth with regard to the concept of religion. But briefly put, like Barth, Ms. Cotta used the term religion for the human activity that opposes the special revelation in Christ or the special revelation of the name. But other than Barth, Ms. Cotta described this religious stance of humanity as the sacralization of the existing. Religion is the inclination to be in full awe of the world around you. Then he discovered that religion as such is not a key concept in the Bible itself. And Ms. Cotta seemed to choose another additional word that would, prefer, that would refer to this particular sense of life. And in his book, Edda and Torah, that appeared in 1939, we get the impression that Ms. Cotta eagerly opts for another concept that is closer to him and more biblical. That concept is paganism. Uh, it refers to the biblical distinction between the Am Yisrael and the Goyim, between the Jews and the Gentiles. In Edda and Torah, Ms. Cotta defines paganism as the religion of the human nature, always and everywhere. In the books that he wrote shortly before and during World War II, it is even hard to discern a distinction between religion and paganism in his work. They seem almost mutually exchangeable. To avoid misunderstandings, it may be good to stress that with paganism, Ms. Cotta does not refer to particular religious traditions or their real existing followers in the past or in the present. Nor does he have in mind the more general notion of polytheism or even atheism or a specific group of people who do not believe in God. On the contrary, the paganism that the message of the Old Testament opposes is something very close to us all. Miss Cotta saw its most extreme perversion reflected in the ideology of the National Socialists, happening right before his eyes. But uh, he identified this as an extreme nihilistic version of the paganism that humanity as a whole, including the church, is always in danger of slipping into. So to sum up, the material theological meaning of paganism in Miss Cotta's perception could best be summarized as the veneration of the existing order. Paganism does not refer to a lack of religion or the absence of religious convictions, but on the contrary, to religious ecstasy for whatever exists. This veneration of what exists, the being, can take many, many forms from very primitive, as we see it, worship of wooden idols, to extremely sophisticated metaphysical philosophies. And yet, all these forms can be reduced, according to Miss Cotta, to a common denominator, which is nothing less than the prosternation for life. That's a quote from Miss Cotta. Paganism in any form is characterized by declaring the existing, the being, as authoritative. In Biblical ABCs, Miss Cotta sketches the pagan worldview as a closed world in which the lonely human being is left no other option than to accept and then even worship fate. The pagan is ultimately the lonely hero who takes up his fate in a silent universe. There may be gods in the pagan universe, there may be even a lot, but they only re reflect the forces and the fate that human beings experience in this world.
says it like this in our new translation, paganism uh, projects divine names out of their experience of life in the world. Zeus or Odin, the all life fate. So they are all projections, words for projections of our own experiences. For Miskotte, it is the unique name of the Lord, Adonai, who crosses the closeness of this universe. Adonai, the God of Israel, does not equal fate or life as it is. On the contrary, the speech act of the word liberates humanity from this silent and lonely fate by speaking. Uh, let me briefly check. Well, I, when, I, when there, the time is up, I'll do let me know. Um, and I have a quote from this too. So speaking is the anti-pagan act uh, par excellence. The phrase that occurs, and this is a quote from Biblical ABC, is the phrase that occurs more often than any other in scripture, so often that we might gloss over it out of habits or boredom, is this, and God said, or then God spoke. Already this claim distinguishes the creation story, for example, from the seemingly similar mythologies of the nations. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In paganism, people speak or shout to silent fate. The deeper this silence becomes, the more shrilly do humans, human cries ring out until they are stifled and, even, and they ebb into a cruel silence of submission, which amounts to the death of the soul. We can now understand the second half of this uh, book that we are discussing today. After the emphasis on the methodological and theological priority of the particular, in chapters about the name and the divine virtues, Miss Cotter focuses in the second half on the key words, word, the start of a genuine history, given with the biblical key word, way, chapter nine, that leads mankind out of its occupying myth, out of its belief that the world is good as it is. Paganism in the Miskotian sense essentially does not know about history, nor about real expectation, which he discusses in chapter 11, because the pagan world is ultimately closed in a totalitarian way. In a small finale, biblical ABC ends with an outlook on the life of the community, the community that testifies to this grand alternative to paganism. And that's chapter 12. The church may not be what we think it might be. Miss Cotta identifies congregation in the biblical sense as core groups, little cells in society, which by reading the biblical text, resist the paganism in society and also in themselves. Church is not the worldly power of an institute or a dogma, but it is these marginal groups of resistance, like salt that salts the earth. They resist the temptation of the pagan myth that the given things like blood and soil be our destiny. And maybe in times like ours, we should say race or identity, the things that are as they are that they are not our destiny. Finally, it should be stressed that Miss Cotte does not aim for a judgment of paganism. Rinse Rilling Brouwer already pointed that out. On the contrary, Miss Cotte recognizes the paganism he describes in every fiber of his own being. Moreover, Miss Cotte realizes that there cannot be a meta position from which a judgment could be made. We are all pagans after all. If indeed paganism is the religion of natural man, there is no point in condemning it. It's quite the opposite. He wants to honor and appreciate paganism in all its cultural expressions. We are constantly showing a lack of understanding and appreciation of paganism, is a quote from Miss Cotte. It cannot be dismissed by judging it and placing it outside ourselves. 
This does not mean, however, that the biblical texts do not criticize paganism. On the contrary, the Bible is full of judgment. The critical stance of the biblical texts is something that Miss Cotter recognizes and appreciates as one of the main contributions of the Bible to humankind. This is very hard to understand nowadays, in times in which most of us struggle with the alleged ex exclusive and even violent language of the Bible. But it is precisely in this debate that one of Miss Cotter's contribution could be decisive. Miss Cotter does not consider the judgment of paganism uh, a sort of exclusive religious zealotism, but he considers it as a liberation. The word, even the divine judgment, liberates humanity from the bondage to the demons, from the house of the religious slavery. And speaking of the psalm, Miss Cotter praises, uh, speaks about the praise the praise of the Psalms is the joy of a soul drenched in wonder that we do not have to be pagans anymore. Miss Cotter considers the biblical text not only a criticism of religion, but a criticism of our own religion, our own inclination to venerate the existing order instead of trusting the name who liberates mankind from its bondage to fate from the given status quo. Even though the concept of occupation is absent in biblical ABCs, and there I, of course, sin against his own method, because the word occupation does not occur in biblical ABCs. Uh, and I think that is because Miss Cotta wanted to avoid uh, wakening a rather sleepy German censor. But I think that Occupation is still exactly what Miss Cotter would consider to be the human condition. Humanity is occupied by alienating forces, powers, he calls them, that lead humankind away from its original calling, namely to be human. Miss Cotter shows that by carefully following the biblical keywords, the Bible functions as a mirror to our times. Like Miss Cotter discovered that the key concept of the Nazi ideology, like hero, ideal, eternity, virtue, are not the decisive concepts in the Bible. In the same manner, we can have our own ruling concepts criticized by the biblical preference for completely different keywords, like name, word, way, and expectation. This criticism concerns the church as much as the world, Miss Cotter shows that a theology that is grounded in the key words of scripture has the ability to both criticize the confessional doctrines, this first and foremost, saving the church from the pagan tendency within itself, and at the same time, criticize the secular powers that rule the world and that rule our own hearts and minds. Thank you for your kind attention.